This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, host of the original Southern Remedy, the show where I answer your medical questions. Subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy on any podcasting app. From MPB Think Radio, this is Money Talks. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Nancy Lotridge anderson president of New Perspectives. She's also a chartered financial analyst. On Money Talks, we answer your personal finance questions. Today, though, we're also going to have a number of tips on how to get the most from your money when grocery shopping. You can also contact us by email. The address is money at mpbonline.org. We sometimes don't have time to answer emails during the show, uh, but you'll get a personal email response anytime you email money at mpbonline.org. And to start the show each week, we'd like to talk about financial news in the news. So good morning, Nancy. What's on your mind today? Well, good morning. Was that new music we had this morning, Kevin? It was indeed. It started last week, but uh, it wasn't in all the proper places, so I did a little uh, editing, and yes, that's a jaunty new theme song we've got going on. Well, well, it just threw me off. You know, I (laughs) I like that one music that says, okay, hit your mark. Here we go. (laughs) Well, a lot of things going on, and of course, you know, in our office, it's Baby Watch, and so a writer is um, uh, not with us today because he's waiting for baby number two to show up. And mm-hmm. so we're anxious about that. And, and I love that they didn't, um, find out, uh, gender beforehand. And so it's going to be a great surprise, which is what we used to do back in the old days. <laughs> uh, so that's a fun thing, but a lot of financial news going on for a long time. We've been talking about recession, recession. What are we going to have a recession? Is it on the horizon for about the last 18 months? And now it's like, yeah, okay. Uh, it's down to a probability of about 15%. And that is because consumers have been spending money and keeping things going. But consumer spending is starting to slow down. And in particular, that leisure spending, all those trips that we delayed taking, all those vacations. And now we've kind of done all of that. Uh, and it's starting to ease somewhat. But that depends on where you are in the country. And of course, we're also seeing that the baby boomers are still blowing and going because they were the last ones to come out of the house. And, uh, you know, they got a raise from Social Security. Uh, their portfolios are looking good. So they're they're fueling all of this for us. So that's good news. Um, we're also watching the UAW talks. This is the United Auto Workers Union. And uh, this is near and dear to my heart because my first husband was a General Motors employee. And those benefits that we had back in the old days were certainly what helped helped us when he was so ill, and I still collect a small pension from that. That has changed for a lot of those auto workers, and many of them uh, are in a different pay scale with different benefits, and it's harder and harder for them to really have a good living under that system, and so that's what they are negotiating about right now. If they go on strike, that is going to be a big one because that's a lot of people out of work. Um, sitting on the sidelines, not spending, and could have a real ding to our GDP. Um, The other thing we're watching today is Apple is unveiling their new products, and they're going to have some new iPhones. Uh, More expensive, of course, but the big news is you won't have to have a special iPhone connection to charge your iPhone. And uh, so that's good news for us who are sometimes scrambling to get those charges done. And then finally, the other thing I noticed is that we're starting to hear about IPOs, initial public offerings. And IPOs don't usually happen when the market is down, when the economy is slow, because those companies who are offering shares to the public want to get the best price they can get. So one of the big ones uh, looking to go public right now is Instacart. But a caution to investors, if you're just a regular investor out there, you are probably never going to get shares of an IPO. You're going to have to wait for it to go on the secondary market. And also the other caution is that most IPOs a year from the point at which they become public are trading at less than their public offering price. So be careful. Many times there's a lot of hype to those. 
All right. <clears throat> some great stuff. Got some follow-ups there. So let's start back with the UAW. Are they negotiating specifically with one automaker, and then when they set maybe something up that applies to others, or how does that work? Well, I think they're negotiating with all of the automakers, and that tends to be what they do. Now, I don't know all the details of it. I was listening this morning to um, a young woman who works uh, in the auto industry and just talking about how difficult it is for her to pay her bills and now working a second job. That was unheard of back in the day. If you were an auto worker, those were great jobs, and they have uh, different tiers in those systems because of the competition with labor, and so many of those um, salaries are lower, and certainly they're asking for some improvements in their benefits, too. Uh, do you think it makes it more difficult from the union standpoint to have to be negotiating with a number of different c- companies at the same time? I, I would think that would give them more leverage because they're negotiating as a group. And, of course, it helps them that they're in the middle of a very tight labor market. So for the auto industry, they don't want to lose those workers who've already been trained, who might go somewhere else. And so that they, had, they have some leverage. But this is really tricky. And I was also listening to um, a congresswoman from Michigan saying she is very concerned, and she's a former auto worker, and she's concerned that they will go on strike, and that will uh, affect their entire region, and it will affect the entire economy. This is Money Talks. We're going over some of the financial news in the news this week, but we have some open phone lines if you have a personal finance question for us, or is uh, we're going to be talking about some money-saving tips at the grocery store today. So if you have one that you'd like to share with us, please call as well. So Nancy, you mentioned the IPOs and the secondary market. Remind us of what that means, the secondary market. Well, an IPO, an initial public offering, is when a company offers shares to the public for the very first time. And when that happens, the company sells shares and the company gets the money from the sale of those shares. Once, and that happens in what's called the primary market, and that allows companies to raise money, to raise capital, to then carry on their business and do whatever they need to do to grow. But once that happens, then those shares begin to be traded in the secondary market. And the secondary market is what we see every night on the news or watching about, well, what is the Dow doing? We just heard it on the radio just recently. What's happening right now with the Dow or the NASDAQ or the S&P 500? That's the secondary market. And in the secondary market, investors are buying and selling shares among each other. And so when those trades happen, that company – Um, Apple, for instance, if you bought shares of Apple, Kevin, today, Apple would not get any of that money. You're buying that from somebody else who already owns Apple. And so that allows for liquidity and uh, allows for investors to then cash out at at their time schedule. Um, And so we need both of those. We need the ability to raise capital so companies can conduct business. That's a primary market. And we need that liquidity and flexibility that comes with the secondary market when traders are or investors are trading among themselves. And I think you also mentioned that the average Joe might not get a crack at one of these IPOs. Who who generally who generally gets gets to them? Well, usually you have a syndicate, a group of brokers who um, assist in uh, getting these shares to market. And um, and so they're going to uh, allow those shares to go to their best customers, which are going to be people with really, really big accounts. And so the more hype in an offering, uh, the, the less likely you are as just a regular person to be able to get in line and get shares. And when you want shares of a company in an IPO, you do get in line. You say, I'd like to have shares. And by the time they get to you, there may be none available. It just depends on how popular it is. Now, there have been some other ways of uh, – introducing shares to the market and uh, in certain auction situations that allow investors to get involved. And they've been experimenting with some things like that. But generally, your big time investors are the ones that get the lion's share. And as you mentioned, the new iPhone is coming out today. On uh, Morning Edition this morning, I heard a a feature that they were talking to a guy uh, about the new phone who was a big iPhone fan and actually had bought the original iPhone and still had it with him. And so on the story this morning, he brought it into the studio and he's like, look, it'll even turn on. And they're like, oh, my gosh, it still turns on. And then they said, uh, let's take a selfie. 
And so they pick the phone up and they sat there and the guy says, oh, yeah, this one doesn't have the forward facing camera. That didn't come out till like iPhone oh. four or whatever. So golly, we don't even think about those things anymore, do we? Right. I thought that was interesting about how much it's advanced that those are sort of well, your camera doesn't have a front facing camera, you know, your phone that is. But so it was kind of interesting to me to, again, see how far that uh, iPhone has advanced. I know that I'm certainly a big fan of the iPhone. I've had several versions. I, I never save mine, though. I always sort of trade them in to get some sort of <laughs> a bump towards getting the new one. Well, I think the latest one is going to be 15. Um, I'm somewhat farther behind than that. Uh, But I think, and I usually don't go for the latest and greatest because it's going to be the most expensive. Yeah, I try to stay a couple behind just to save some money there. So you're listening to Money Talks on MPB Think Radio. Our website, moneytalks.mpbonline.org, is one way to hear past Money Talks broadcasts. You can also download the MPB Public Media app for your smartphone and listen to all the local MPB Think Radio programs on your schedule. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Nancy Lodger-Janderson, president of New Perspectives. So, Nancy, before we take our trip to the grocery store, I did have one question, and that is we talk a lot about debit cards and credit cards and the differences thereof. But I think like mine, most debit cards can function as either a debit card or a credit card. Correct, yeah. And so it has the PIN number, I guess, for when it's a debit card, and then the little three-digit security code on the back of the card when you're using it as a credit card. Do you get any of the same protections that you would with a credit card, or is that just a way to make it work as a credit card? Gosh, Kevin, that's a good question. I am not sure, and I need to check on that, because we always talk about – with a debit card, that money immediately comes out of your account. And if there's a problem, yeah, it can go back in. You can um, file a complaint, but it's going to take a while for that money to go back in. Whereas if you have a credit card, then that's getting a loan. And so when the bill shows up and you say, that wasn't me, you don't have to pay it. And you're not out anything until this all gets sorted out. So I'm not sure if you're using your debit card as a credit card. It seems to me it should still function as a credit card like a loan. But I'm not sure how the bank views that. So I need to check on that one because that's a big deal. And, of course, the other big deal, I always feel bad about this, but for our local retailers, it costs them less if you use it as a debit card percentage-wise on that purchase than if you use it as a credit card. But for the the end user, it really is better if you use it as a credit card. And I I would just – something I just thought of that makes me think that it does kind of function more like a credit card when you use it that way because I know like at Kroger or some of the other grocery stores, when you – to get the cash back option, you have to pretend – well, pretend, but you have to use it as a debit card and not a credit card. And so – you know, maybe that's that's part well, of the story, I guess. Have you have you tried using it? Because I I don't I don't let mine go back and forth. I have clearly I have a debit card which I use mainly for ATMs, and then I use credit for purchases. But have you tried using your credit card, Kevin, and then going and looking at your bank account to see did that money come out immediately, or are you waiting for some sort of bill? I have not, but that's a good. You know, I think the most time I would use my debit card as a credit card would be for online purchases. I mean, because that's you know my primary way yeah. of, of so. Uh, but that's interesting. And and actually, I was doing what this came up uh, yesterday. I was doing a little research for a future topic, so maybe we can talk about credit cards, debit cards, advantages, disadvantages, that sort of thing. Uh, because it's uh, you know as I thought about that, well, so I thought, well, that's an interesting question. So, uh, well, and certainly for online purchases, you really want that protection of if if someone grabs your number, uh, if there's a dispute of some kind, then you can go back and say, no, I'm not going to pay that bill. This is Money Talks on MPB Think Radio. We're looking for any personal finance questions that you might have for us this morning. A friend of the program starts us off. We'll go to Pascagoula and say good morning to Brother Daniel. Go ahead, Brother Daniel. You're on there with us. Hey. Hi. How y'all doing this morning? You hear me? Good yeah. morning. We got you. Go ahead. Yeah, all right. Well, listen, I am um, a hey, uh, hey, Mississippi. I need you to keep staying alive. Keep that love going. We need that love, that magnolia. Um, I have a Chime card, which is also a Visa card. I, I found out, yes, um, they, uh, you know, they run an investigation. But, yes, uh, I, I do get that protection, just like the credit card. Not only that, 
I also found out, and people need to start looking at your Visa and your MasterCard, there is insurance when you buy a, a big product or anything. You know, I didn't know they still did that, but it, it, it's an insurance when you uh, uh, buy an item and you're not satisfied with it. So you need to find out from your bank, uh, your Visa, and your MasterCard, let them know you have it. Because that's what I did with Chimes. I had bought an item that was worth about six hundred dollars. I wasn't happy with the item. Uh, I, I, it was damaged, and I, I lost. I had the receipt, and uh, they, they checked it out. It took about two weeks, but I got my money back. Excellent. So you yeah. know, you, you, you know what I'm saying. So it's so important today. Ladies and gentlemen of Mississippi, we must follow the instructions when we get these cards. Make sure there's no scam with the card. Make sure we understand what the fees are about because it's not being taught in the school. So the kids figure, well, I'm going to give me a debit card. I'm going to give me a cash app card. I'm going to give me a chime card. And, they, and a lot of them are ruining their credit as well as owing and and not being instructed on how to use it. So please, ladies and gentlemen, your parents, listen. Please teach your kids about understanding what it is about credit card, debit card, to check. If you don't understand, please call Mississippi Public Broadcasting System and ask them questions. This is what is needed to increase and make sure we understand about finance. This is what we need in Mississippi. All right, Brother Daniel, great stuff. Always good to hear from you. Appreciate the call. And Nancy, one thing he said that I think is the case. So if you uh, if you were offered like an extended warranty on a, say, an appliance purchase at a big box store or whatever, and you were going to pay for it with a credit card, there are, I guess, some protections that the credit card offers that would maybe factor in your decision on whether to get any sort of an extended warranty. Well, possibly. Now, understand, every time you open a credit card account, what you don't realize is attached to that, and that very tiny print is your contract. And that contract says, this is how this will work. So if you um, take out a loan to purchase a car, for instance, you did that recently, Kevin, you are signing a contract that says, this is how this loan will work. It's the same with a credit card. And so many of them do offer insurance. There's a limit to it. So if you're looking for a warranty, generally, that's going to be for a longer term than what you would be allowed with a credit card. So just, just try to understand what they're offering you. Like Brother Daniel mentioned, he had an item that was broken on the front end. Um, that's very different than getting an item that's in pristine condition and then three months later there's a problem. So I don't think they're going to honor that. Uh, and that's where a warranty might come into play, even though I'm not a fan of warranties because most um, larger items have built-in protections. Also, I thought he made a good point, you know, anytime you get any kind of credit card or whatever, new card, uh, to go ahead and, you know, check the fee, like you were just saying. It's going to be a contract, so go ahead and at least skim through the tiny print, I guess. Well, you need to know not only what are the, if there's an annual fee, but you need to know what interest rate they're charging you. I am always amazed, Kevin, that people come to see us and they have credit card debt, and when I ask them, well, what are the rates that you're paying? Well, I don't know. I mean, I would never, would you have signed up for your auto loan without knowing what you're going to be paying as far as your interest rate? No. No, of course not. Or uh, you wouldn't buy a house without knowing what the rate is on that mortgage. It's the same with a credit card, and every credit card is going to have its own separate interest rate that they charge you. They can vary that, so they can change that. They're flexible with those, so pay attention. They have to alert you, but you need to know what you're paying every time you put down that card. We've got a call to get to, but one quick follow-up on that. I've, I've not. Is the annual fee somewhat going away with credit cards? Or the, the ones I have don't have that, or is it my credit is most good? Most don't. Okay. No, most don't. But um, American Express is one that still maintains an annual fee for most people, um, and uh, it has become more competitive. So pay attention to that. And sometimes that annual fee, for instance, I pay an annual fee on my Amazon card that I use, my credit card, but then I have all kinds of other um values that are added on like you know because i order a lot from amazon and so it shows up just 
the next day. It's great. Um, and also my uh, Amazon Prime membership, that's built into all of that. So, But it, it, it is an annual fee. You need to make sure that if you're paying that annual fee that you're really getting something for that value. All right, let's uh, move on next. We're going to go to Memphis. Dila is on the line. Good morning. You're on the air with us. Go ahead. Hi. Um, you guys were questioning whether a uh, debit card used as a credit card uh, shows up immediately. Did anybody actually answer that while I was waiting? No, go no, ahead. Dita. What do you have for us? Okay. So what I have noticed is that when you do use it like that, um, there's a pending you know, charge. You can actually go to your online banking and you'll see the charge and it's pending until they figure out like how much it is. So it does actually go through immediately. And I don't think it's considered a loan. Ah, so even if you use it as a credit card, it functions like mm-hmm. this debit card okay yes you're basically just protecting your pin which is really not much at all but still it's i guess one layer but but yeah but i've noticed that so i'm that would be my guess is that that it does not function as a credit card as much as it does a debit card because by the next day it's a done deal like it's out well, that means my practice of keeping my debit card for my ATM and my credit card for my purchases is what I need to continue doing. Yes, exactly. Exactly. All right. So, th- thank you. Yeah. No problem. Bye, guys. All right. Good. Uh, thank you, Dila, for that. You know, I, I see that the pending. Uh, I wonder, too, if they're if in order. I mean, would a debit charge go first on, a, on you know, when the way the bank. Oh, that's a good question. For instance, if you're down to your last few dollars, yeah. Right. But it does sound like they put the, the security code on the back just so that it can function as a, as a credit card if, if you need it to. Money Talks is MPB Think Radio's personal finance broadcast. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Nancy Lottridge-Anderson, president of New Perspectives. She's a chartered financial analyst. And ready to answer some personal finance questions this morning. Uh, we've got a couple of callers on the line, so let's uh, go back to the phones. Uh, to pass Christian, we go, and Cindy has called in today. Good morning, Cindy. You're on the air with us, so go ahead. Oh, hello. Good day. Um, I just have two comments I thought were kind of interesting to, for this um, topic. Um, so one is uh, to be aware for people to be aware um, on, uh, I got a letter from, um, I've gotten two of them actually so far that say that my credit, uh, my debit card has been, somebody stolen my ID, blah, blah, blah. And that they're offering, that the, it, and it looks like it comes from the bank and it says that they're offering a uh, one year of protection uh, so your ID doesn't get stolen. And you, you're supposed to fill it out if you want it. But in the small print, it, and after one year, you get charged 80 something dollars. Um, and so, I mean, people should be careful not to just fill that out without reading the details because surprise, a year later, you're getting charged 80 something dollars. Um, and I don't even know that anything ever happened with my ID. I've never had any indication of that. And the other thing is, is just this just just happened to to me. Um, Prior to going on a week's vacation, I transferred money from my savings um, over to my debit card checking, you know, my checking. But I guess I didn't submit it at the end. So I went on vacation, I pulled out my credit card, you know, I'm using my credit card, or not my credit card, my debit card, and and uh, when I got home, I had almost $200 worth of um, bounced, you know, bounced, not checks, but... Right, overdrawn. Mm-hmm. Overdraw, overdraw fees, see, see, yeah, I've never had one in my whole life, and it turns out that Sometimes when you have that um, protection, the overdraft protection on your account, it's not so good because I would have rather used my credit card and have it declined than get home and have all these overdraw charges. You see what I'm saying? Like maybe I'm going to take the overdraft protection off my account for that particular reason. I didn't know that they just kept letting you use your debit card even though there's no money. 
So, in other words, yeah, um, they they honored that, but then they charged you, right? Exactly, and they charged me wow. a lot. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Thirty five dollars every time I used it, and um, I I I wasn't aware of that. I always thought, oh, good overdraft protection, but mm, maybe not. I, you know, if I had known there was no money in my account. If the, you know, if the vendor had said, no, you don't, this card isn't good, well, then I would have looked at my account and realized, oh, you know, I messed up. So anyway, I just yeah. thought I'd mention that. Uh, thank and, you, Cindy. That's uh, some good points there. Nancy, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, um, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I have had that happen to me, Cindy, because, you know, you're in the middle of trying to do something like move money. The kids are in the background. You know, your husband's yelling about, you know, where where's the mayonnaise? Um, it's uh, life is going on when you're trying to transact business. And sometimes you don't get the final piece done. But she is correct that if she had gotten kicked out, she could have. Uh, probably gone online somewhere and seen what her error was and gone ahead and moved that money and covered it. But that also brings us back to this idea of anything that you purchase, like um, this overdraft protection, you need to make sure you understand how it functions. It is a contract. And, uh, And that surprises me that they honored those, but then they still charged her for that. That's really interesting. Um, I would also want to comment about the one-year protection being offered to her from her bank. This is a very common thing that we are seeing anytime any kind of financial institution has a breach of uh, their information then that's one of the things they will do for their customers is offer some sort of ID protection. I have got a letter sitting on my desk right now for a similar situation. I'm going to take them up on it, but um, I'm going to make sure that I don't go beyond that year because I don't want to incur those extra charges. But if it's free, I will still do it. Just make sure that you don't have to put in credit card information so that it re-ups on you before you realize it or that they send you a bill um, at the end of the year. Good points there. Yeah, I, <clears throat> um, th- th- I would also maybe, if you have a calendar, you know, go next year at this time and put something on the date that says, hey, check, you know, to make sure I'm not going to get billed for something again. Good point, Cindy. Thanks for your call. Let's uh, stay on the phone lines. I think Adila from Memphis has called back in with another comment, so we will go to that call. Good morning. Uh, what do you have for us? Hey. Okay, so first of all, I hope Cindy didn't pay all those overdraft fees because if you're a customer in good standing, you can always get a whole bunch of them waived. But that's, you oh, know, kind of fair. Good point, yeah. Yeah, I hardly ever. Um, but anyway, so that's one thing. And then other thing, when I was um, mentioning, I know that a lot of people don't write checks anymore, but we sometimes have to, like for rent maybe, if you're renting from like a person or whatever. And if, and if you make deposits and write checks on the same day, I think – uh, I remember learning this when I first got my bank account, like back in the day. Uh, but the bank is always obligated to make the deposits first and then do the draft, like do the uh, debit, uh, I think by law. Mm-hmm. Um, so if it's within the same, you know, like business day or whatever, they will do that. Um, so I just wanted to kind of point that out as well. Um, one other thing, and I have this serious problem and I just remember this would be a perfect place to actually ask about it. Um, so I created a CD account for my mom. I'm basically taken over her finances for, you know, health reasons. And, um, so I created a CD account. It was money that was from a trust that's in, that she's the sole beneficiary, but, um, she, um, but they would the it was Goldman Sachs and they wouldn't open a CD account in the name of a trust, so I had to put her name on it. And for whatever reason, they they eventually I don't know what red flagged it, but they marked it as fraud. Uh, I don't know why, uh, but for the longest time they wouldn't even talk to me about it. They were like, "Oh no, we this has been marked. We're investigating." I'm like, "What are you investigating? Tell me, and I'll give you the information you need." You know. And they kept stonewalling me about it. And it was a good chunk of money. I mean, it was like $50,000. It still is. And so, oh, my gosh. It's been ongoing for about a month now trying to get this money either back or whatever, just settled. And 
I don't know what else to do. Like, I've called them. I've gotten angry with them. I've gotten nice with them. I've tried every tone I can think of. And they're just, oh, yes, we're investigating. And I'm like, okay, well, tell me. I will give you the information. And they won't talk to me. And even with my mom sitting there and verifying, they still are like, oh, I don't know. Okay, Dila, let me ask some questions, okay? Um, First is that 50000 came from a trust account, correct? Yes. All right, where did it come from? What was the institution? Uh, Wells Fargo. Okay, so you should be able to go back to Wells Fargo and tell them to void that check. Is it not too late? I mean, this has been months now. I mean, we're yeah, almost I, at the point where it's paying me back plus interest. It was a CD account for a reason. They've held my money for this long, and literally next month they were supposed to get, you know, it was the end of the contract, you know? And, so and they've I'm, held I'm, my money for this long and take, you know, and not giving me anything and taking the money. I mean, it's just, okay, I feel like they would, should take the interest as well. Okay, do you have power of attorney for your mom? Yes. Okay, does Goldman Sachs have a copy of that power of attorney? I have sent it to them, yes. Okay, you should be able to, um, because it sounds like maybe they're not willing to speak to you if that's not registered correctly with them. I'm also confused about um, this 50000 Was it considered income from the trust? which is the reason they would not open it in the trust name again. And I don't know what kind of trust this is that she has. Um, and well, so that's it's, a little... it's a living trust, and she's the sole beneficiary. But that's all secondary to the fact that one of them actually, I guess, you know, let the cat out of the bag and said something like, we don't create CD accounts from trust accounts, and this was a trust account the money came from. I'm like, well, you didn't have any money taking the $50,000 ahead of time and then telling me six months later that you don't do this. Then what? what's the holdup? You either return my money immediately with the interest of six months, the half of it or whatever, or you you can't just hold on to the money. You know, like they're just it's like in a in a in a purgatory or something. Yeah. Yeah. This is a and I don't know all the details here, but. Um, if you submitted a power of attorney, um, you should be able to then at least write a letter or you might have to get a local attorney to write a letter for you that's going to the legal department of Goldman Sachs and asking. Now, what happens, uh, and it ha- has happened to us many times, where we're opening an account for a client and it is out of our control because there is a main system monitoring fraud. And what they're looking for is any kind of money laundering, anything that doesn't match on names, social security numbers, that kind of thing. And when that happens, yes, it sometimes gets caught in purgatory or limbo um, until it gets resolved. But the legal department should be able to tell you what the problem is. Can they change the registration on the account to make it uh, work for you um, and what you have to do? But a a local attorney sending a letter to their legal department or you um, asking to speak to the legal department to find out some specifics. But understand, it might not be Goldman Sachs' fault. It may be that there's an overriding um, uh, concern through this system that is monitoring fraud, that that something popped up with a difference there. I can't tell you what it is. And can you, uh, is there anything that's typical or standard about not opening a CD account within, uh, with trust money? Is no, there, we do it all is, the time. It, it happens all the time. Okay. It happens all the time. So I don't so understand why that was. Their own policy or something maybe or whatever that I, I mean, No, it uh, it shouldn't be. I mean, cuz it's Goldman Sachs, good grief. Um they certainly understand about um living trust or revocable trust. Uh I I don't understand what that was about. Um unless and this is what we run into um sometimes because Sometimes institutions are not willing to honor powers of attorney. So if you were signing for something, did your mother sign the paperwork or did you? No, everything was done online. There was no signing. There was nothing. Everything was done online. It was all digital. Okay. Um, 
that may have introduced an, an, another layer for them. Um, ooh, um, I, I, again, I think you're going to have to somehow talk to the legal department and find out what you can do. Now, your mo- the money is still there. It's still earning interest, so they, are, they have to honor all of that. But there's something happening behind the scenes, and I don't have all the details of that. Um, if you have the power of attorney, they should speak to you. The legal department should speak to you and help you understand how you can unwind this. All right. That's really actually a good tip because that's one thing I didn't think about was talking okay, to somebody. Well, in which- yeah, good luck. Understand that, that we Thanks. have dealt with, with some of these things ourselves, and sometimes it just takes a lot of patience and a lot of jumping through hoops. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Good luck. All right. Good call. Thanks for the uh, tips on the front end there as well. We're glad you found our show, Money Talks. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Nancy Lotridge-Anderson, president of New Perspectives. There's still time for you to work in a personal finance question. If you give us a call right now, the number 1-877-MPB-RING. It's 1-877-672-7464. Holding on from Mobile is our friend Mikey, so we'll say good morning to her. Good morning, Mikey. You're on the air with us, so go ahead. Good morning. I appreciate this, and I hope that it's not even a necessary call, but I figure everybody needs to know about this. Um, I can't be the only one. My nearby local office bank office now this is you know there are several other um offices also nearby in the city was robbed um uh i have of course the account that i have with them is a savings account long established fdic insured uh and it's below the 250,000 as i understand but you know that limit is um is there is there any special advice or precautions should I get something in writing for my protection regarding that account? No, you're going to be fine. Um, and understand that many years ago, banks were what were called unit banks, which meant there was just one location, but now we have multiple branches. Um, all of those accounts are handled electronically. Um, so that your your money is safe and protected under that FDIC insurance limit, which you mentioned is two hundred fifty thousand per person per account and per bank, um, and um, so you are fine. And the only thing you need to be concerned about is making sure if this bank was robbed, is it um, susceptible? So maybe you need to bank at a different branch just for your own safety uh, concern there. Well, I do on and off. I, I bank at more than one of the accounts for convenience sake. Thank goodness. <laughs> so, yeah, um, yeah. You're, I, I you're and I don't, I don't, I don't want to damage their business either. They've been a good bank for quite some time, and uh, I just wanted to know if there's anything else I should do. <laughs> no, I think you should be Thank fine. You. And the the concern I have um, because access is so important. And so communities that lose access to bank branches because you've got some folks that are doing some things not so nice, like robbing banks, then that puts them at risk that they can't get to banks. Now, certainly we're doing a lot more banking online, but for older people, they still need to have a local branch branch that they can go to and take care of their business. Well, I happen to be one of those older people. How did you know? <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Take care. Thank you. All right, Mikey. Thanks for calling. Good to hear from you today. Uh, Let's go next to Bolton. Mojo has called in today. Good morning. You're on the air with us. Yes. uh, I just wanted to comment on the, well, every aspect of credit card on to the gal who has a power of attorney, and it involves Bank of America, I think she said, or Wells Fargo and Goldman Sachs. Uh. We keep getting hit in the head with the same bat. These largest of institutions really uh, need to be avoided. Community banks, where you can go in and speak to the president, and or, even better, the credit unions, seem to be the option that hadn't been mentioned, but make it far easier to deal with all of the issues that have been discussed. The banksters are going to take 
until they can take no more. Look at what happened in Cyprus. They called it bail-in. That's, that's the way they operate. Thank you. All right, uh, Mojo, thanks for the call. Nancy, c- comments? Uh, Bill, I am a fan of community banks, and often um, you will find even better interest rates quoted on things like CDs and savings accounts at those community banks because they're trying to be competitive. Um, I like credit unions as well because many times those credit unions, especially the smaller ones, you are putting a deposit in that's being used to loan out money for somebody who's also in that employee group who needs help with purchasing a car or an appliance or something like that. And um, so those are good things to have. And yes, there is value to having a relationship with a local banker so you can go in and speak to that person when you have problems. All right, uh, Nancy, just got a couple minutes left. So we've talked a lot about this. So when dealing with maybe a a larger financial institution, um, do you think it's a good idea to start with a phone call or start right away with a letter so that you have that written copy and then it sort of sets a paper trail up? Well, it, it depends on what your issue is, but usually I would start with a phone call. But if you make a phone call, what we do in my office is we always, we're recording when we made that phone call, who we spoke to. We asked for their name. We asked for their extension. Uh, we record what they told us. And um, because often you'll have to go back and say, well, you said this was going to happen within three days and it has not happened. Please explain. Um, And then work your way up the chain. If you've made a couple of phone calls and you don't get any resolution, a letter. So a formal letter uh, often will shake the tree a little bit, especially if you send it certified mail. So you can say, I know this person picked up this mail and I want a response to that. But yes, it is harder to deal with a bigger institution. And um, I do want to say this particular issue that um, Dila talked about, I don't know that it's this institution's fault Um, They got a fraud alert because there is an overall system monitoring that. And so they're stuck with it just like she's stuck with it. And then also, I guess, sort of if you have frustrated and you're not getting responses from phone calls and letters, that would be the time to possibly contact a local attorney. I mean, that sounds like that's kind of the last step, I guess. Yeah. And sometimes just a, a, a letter from an attorney on an attorney's letterhead will cause them to pay attention and understand that they don't want to be a problem. They want these things to go away, too. Um, but they're looking for the easiest way for that to happen. All right. We will save our grocery shopping saving tips for a later program. Had a great show today. Thanks to everybody that called in. Money Talks is a production of MPB Think Radio, funded in part by generous financial support from listeners. To hear today's show or a previous show, you can visit moneytalks.mpbonline.org or listen to the podcast by searching for Money Talks. So for Dr. Nancy Lotcher-Jenderson, I'm Kevin Farrell, inviting you to join us every Tuesday at 9 for Money Talks. It's heard only on MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. 